affliction and misery are the common burden of the sons of Adam. In the present life, all are subject to misery, some more, some less. We walk through a valley of tears, live in a groaning world. None have such an uninterrupted current of worldly happiness, but that they have their crosses and afflictions. These things are common to man. We are told in the book of Job 5 verse 7, Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. In 14 verse 1, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. None can reasonably expect to be absolutely exempted from the common lot of human fallen nature. Though life be short, yet it is long enough to be vexed with many sorrows. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, saith old Jacob. Genesis 47 verse 9. They are evil, it is well that they are but few. Few men consider this, that they come into the world to bear crosses, but rather imagine they come here to spend their days in pleasure. At least they do not observe the true cause of their troubles, nor the remedy. The true cause is sin. Man's transgressions are the door by which it entered, and a proper remedy is the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Whatever then may be the particular and various dispensations of God towards men, yet to be miserable in some sort or degree is common to all Adam's posterity, which should make us look higher than the present life. Christ has promised in happiness that will countervail all these afflictions. There is a twofold comparison which believers usually make, or in Scripture are taught to make between this life and that which is to come. Sometimes they compare temporal good things with eternal good things, or the portion of the carnal man with the happiness of the child of God. From men, which are of thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world, which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure, they are full of children, and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. As for me, I will behold your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with your likeness. Number two, sometimes they compare temporal evil things with eternal evil things as a prison with hell, or the killing of the body with the casting the body and soul into hell fire. Be not afraid of them that kill the body, but after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Luke 12, 4 and 5. Certainly it is more important to fear displeasing God than displeasing men. The utmost they can do is to kill the body and then their malice is at an end. But God can cast both body and soul into everlasting torments. Everyone would submit to a lesser evil to avoid a greater. When you sin to escape trouble in the world, you run into eternal sufferings to avoid temporal ones. No wrath like the wrath of God. No torments like hell fire. Sometimes they compare temporal good with eternal evil as Matthew 16.26. What is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, the plentiful life of worldlings with the forfeiting of the soul, the pleasure of sin for a season with the pains of hell forever. The fourth sort of comparison which the scriptures direct us to is temporal evil things with eternal good things. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans 8 verse 18. Sufferings for the present may be very great, but the glory that is revealed to us and shall one day be revealed in us is much greater. As there is no comparison between our suffering here and eternal ease and rest, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 4.17 The sufferings of the present world are light and short, not in themselves, but in comparison with eternal life. Themselves they may be, some of them are very sharp and grievous, and some also very long and tedious. But what a point is to a circumference that is time to eternity, and what a feather is to a talent of lead 
that are present evils to future glory and blessedness. All this is spoken to show that it is better to be miserable with the people of God than happy with his enemies, and that we should not be drawn away from Christ either by the comfortable or by the troublesome things we meet with in this world. When you are in a desperate state, and there seems no way of escape, remember that God is the same still. He is able to help now as ever, and can create comforts for you in your greatest troubles. As in the first creation, he made light out of darkness, order out of confusion. So still he is able, out of your confused and perplexed state, to create peace and comfort. You know not what to do, perhaps. Mind is so distracted and troubled. Why? Commit your soul to God. He can raise an excellent frame out of the chaos of your thoughts. Therefore, be not dismayed. Consider you have God in your covenant with you and have to deal with an almighty creator who can send present help in time of need. Therefore, never despair, but frequent the means of grace and still think of God, reconciled to you in Christ Jesus, who has paid your debt of 10,000 talents, and who, having begun a work of grace in you, will perform it unto the end. Commit your soul to him as a faithful creator for guidance and direction in all your perplexities until he bring you to perfect happiness. God does not govern the world only by his will, as an absolute monarch, but by his wisdom and goodness as a tender father. It is not his greatest pleasure to show his sovereign power, or his inconceivable wisdom, but his immense goodness to which he makes his other attributes subservient. What was God's end in creating is his end in governing, which was the communication and diffusion of his goodness. You may be sure from this that God will do nothing but for the best, his wisdom appointing it with the highest reason, and his goodness ordering it to the most gracious end. And because he is the highest good, he does not only will good, but the best good in everything he acts. Now what greater comfort is there than this, that there is one who presides over the world, who is so wise he cannot be mistaken, so faithful he cannot deceive, so pitiful he cannot neglect his people, and so powerful that he can make even stones to be turned into bread, if he please. It should be our great care not to despise the chastening of the Lord, nor to be too much dejected under it. The smart would keep us from despising an affliction in itself, but we make light of it when we are careless of improving it for the ends for which God inflicts it. We may be sensible of the pain when we are not sensible of the profit which may accrue to us by it. God forbids here two extremities, the one an excess, the other a lack of courage. Both dishonor God, the one in his sovereignty, the other in his goodness and love. Both are injurious to the sufferer, as he rebels against the one and loses the sweetness of the other. We should receive the afflictions God sends with humility, without despondency, with reverence, without distrust, and endeavor to keep ourselves from either fearing too much or not fearing God enough. Mix our reverence with confidence. Adore the hand which we feel and rest in the goodness which he promises. This is the way to reap the fruit of affliction. All afflictions, let they be from what immediate causes soever, are from the hand of God. Whether they come from man as loss of goods or other calamities, whether they be sickness, grief, and so on, they are all dispensed by the order of God. For one in the self-same design are instruction and improvement. Human reason will not believe this. Some think they come by chance, or look only to second causes and don't regard them as wholesome instructions from God and the orders of his providence. This should stop any impatient motions in our minds. Fit we should be of the psalmist's temper. Hold our peace because God has done it. Psalm 39, verse 9. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Romans 9, 21. Is not an infinite wisdom joined with the sovereign authority of God? And when we are not able to understand the reason of his conduct, we ought to acquiesce in his will and in his wisdom, and stop the motion of any passions by a humiliation under his hand. How great is the tenderness of God towards his children groaning under any affliction. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, and so on. He calls them his sons, his children, 
sweetening in the name whatsoever is rigorous in the suffering. He gives them a title in which he manifests that in all their affliction he was afflicted. Isaiah 63 verse 9 and has a feeling in their trouble. What father is there on earth unless he has lost all natural affection who does not sympathize in the sufferings of his children? All the compassions of men combined are not to be compared to the tenderness and love of God. Afflictions are not always sent by God in anger with his creatures, but sent by God as a father. For what son is he whom the father doesn't chasten? Hebrews twelve seven. Hence it is easy to conceive that neither the intentions of God, nor the issue of a suffering, can be any other than happy to those that are the children of God, since he gives the name of child and son to every one he instructs, as a father by correction. This will teach us to have a feeling for the sufferings of others. The afflictions of believers are the effects of divine love. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Revelation 3.19 They are not acts of divine revenge in which God would satisfy his justice, but of divine affection in which he communicates his goodness and draws the image of his Son with more beauty and glory. They are the acts of God, not of a sleepy, careless God, but a wise and indulgent Father, who takes all the care both of instruction and correction to train you up to his will and likeness. God indeed afflicts other men who are not in the number of his beloved children. There are few among the sons of men who pass their lives in a continual prosperity, exempt from all kind of affliction, and all these evils are from God as the governor of the world. Yet though there be no difference between the sufferings of the one and the other, and though the sufferings of believers are often more sharp than those of the world in outward appearance, yet there is a vast difference in the motives of them. Love makes them strike the believer, and fury makes them strike the unregenerate man. The design of the correction of the one is their profit, not their ruin. The strokes upon the other are often the first fruits of eternal punishment. Then the world is much mistaken in judging the afflictions of believers to be testimonies of God's anger and hatred. God acts towards the world as a lawgiver and judge, but towards those he hath renewed and adopted in the quality of a father. And who would judge of the hatred of a tender father by the corrections he inflicts upon a child that is dear to him? Believers suffer by God not simply as he is a judge, but as he is a paternal judge. There is a combination of judge and father. God does not intend revenge on them, for though they are afflicted on account of sin, yet the principal aim is to prove them and reform them that they may be made meet for a blessed inheritance. No man then has any reason to fancy himself the object of God's love for outward prosperity. No man knows either love or hatred by all that is before them, Ecclesiastes 9.1. God does not always love those whom his providence preserves in health and ease. Such a conceit proceeds from an ignorance of another life and too great value of the things of this world. Temporal goods, credit in the world, Outward conveniences and uninterrupted health are effects of God's patience and common goodness, but not of his affection unless when by his grace he are made means to conduct us to a better inheritance. But how often are they pernicious to us by reason of our corruption and ill use of them? How often does the health of the body destroy that of the soul and the prosperity of the flesh ruin that of the spirit? How often do riches and honors bind our hearts to the earth and expel any thoughts of an heavenly paradise? How often does a portion in this world make many slack in their endeavors for a portion in heaven? How often do they hinder our sanctification, which is the only means to an happy vision of God? How should this move us in our afflictions to a walk pleasing to God? This is a motive the apostle uses to press his exhortation neither to despise the chastening of God nor to spare of his care. 
Why should we despise that which is dispensed by love? Should we not consider the chastisements which the love of God sends, both good and wise? Is not love the motive of suffering, a sufficient ground to prevent distrust and discouragement? Why should any distrust him by whom he knows he is afflicted? That correction which frightens us is a work of his love, not of his hatred. Should we not then wait in faith for an happy issue of that chastisement which we suffer? If we be once thus affected, we shall receive afflictions in a temper answerable to God, and improve them for those holy ends for which God sends them. We should also bear them patiently, humbly, and submissively, since they are not for the reparation of the holiness of the broken law and the satisfaction of God's justice, but to prove you, to do you good at your latter end. Deuteronomy 8, verse 16, Nay, to meet in the soul for heaven. We have reason, therefore, to bear them, whatever they may be, in patience. It is inexcusable to murmur at an act of love, use in spiritual reason in considering them. When the father scourges, the child cries, and then he thinks the father hates him. It is but the error of his childhood, and when he comes to reason, he will regard it as a false opinion. No righteous man in the world is or ever was free from sin. 1 Kings 8.46 He scourges every son whom he receives. Hebrews 12.6 Sin is the cause of every affliction. Were we free from sin, we should be free from scourges. Afflictions will not cease till sin is quite destroyed, which will not be in this world. Justice would find enough in every believer in the world to punish had he not suffered in the person of a surety, and mercy finds enough to pardon. It is against this, then, we should turn our aim. What Satan would make us vent in impatience against God, let us manifest in a hatred of that which is the true cause of all the evils which in general or particular we suffer. Let us strike that as much as God strikes us, it is the best way in which we can show our love to God, who in his strokes upon us shows his love to us. Let us take no rest till we have put that to death, which alone God hates. It is the death of sin and not the death of the soul God designs in afflictions. It is upon this account an argument for patience. While our disease remains, why should we think ill of the physician for using means for a cure? If he did not use a means, though sharp, we then should have most reason to accuse him of a lack of pity. Sin puts God upon a necessity of scourging. His goodness and wisdom will not allow him to do anything but what is necessary. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. Here the apostle exhorts to a patient bearing of the hand of God, because he deals with them as a father with his sons in a way of reward afterwards. As parents caress those children whom they see submissive after punishment, God treats them as children, and being men they are apt to think that a troublesome affliction is inconsistent with the love of God. The apostle contradicts such a thought by the question, What son is there whom the father chastens not? And he goes further and draws another conclusion that we should be so far from thinking that to be afflicted is a sign of our not being the children of God, that on the contrary he affirms that not to be chastised is a sign that a man is not of God's family. If you are without chastisement in which all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. For if the Lord scourges every son whom he receives, it is clear that he whom he leaves without chastisement, is not a true and legitimate son, but a stranger, a bastard, in other words, one that is not of the family, but takes only the name and quality without any right to it. Thus God then deals with his children, and there is need of it, for though the regenerate are freed from the slavery and dominion of sin, yet while they are clothed with the flesh, the flesh will lust against the spirit, and they cannot do the things that they would, Galatians 5, verse 17. And God not only chastises them for their infirmities, but to prevent them. And since the love which he bears us does infinitely surpass the affections of the best and tenderest fathers, we may well confess that no father in the world can be said to deal with his children so as God does with the believer. 
He offers himself to do a father's office. He is a world sovereign, but the believer's father is he is the governor of the world. He treats men righteously in his judgments. As he is a father of believers, he treats them graciously in their afflictions. Here is a great comfort. If God deal with you as with children and striking you, his wisdom and his goodness are infinite. He does nothing but what is just and reasonable. He is guided by a fatherly affection in all he does. His blows are healthful. If David could account it a kindness, if the righteous would smite him, and count his rebukes as an excellent oil, should we not have the same thoughts of the chastisements of God? They mistake in their rebukes. God cannot. He is too wise to be deceived and too good not to make even his blows become an excellent remedy. He does not assault us as enemies, but as children, not to punish us in his fury, but to refine us, to make us an estate for him to take pleasure in, to make us more like himself in the frame and temper of our souls. We should receive his corrections, therefore, not so much as a punishment, but as a favor. No child of God but is at one time or another under his correcting hand. Noah had an affliction in a child, Genesis 9.25. Abraham and Jacob were afflicted with famine. Isaac by an Esau. Moses was fain to fly for his life. Job suffered the loss of all his children and his goods and was reproached by his friends. To be in affliction is to travel in the road that all God's favored ones have gone before. Affliction is one of the clauses of the covenant God has made with us in Jesus, which he does peculiarly insert. When he owns himself our God and Father, he would visit them with a rod, but not take away his loving kindness. Psalm 89, 32, and 33. In the New Testament, God promises spiritual blessings. In the Old, when he promised more temporal blessings, his people were not exempt from his discipline. And the new, it is more expressed that, through afflictions we must enter into the kingdom of heaven. His only son must suffer, and so enter into glory. God had one son without sin, but none without sorrow. Those sins that are not under his discipline are not his children. Afflictions, therefore, should be so far from discouragements, that where there is an evidence of grace in the heart, they are rather marks of adoption. We might well doubt of a relation to God if he took no care of us, that we were not his sheep. He used not his crook to pull us to himself. Let us then receive his chastisements without repining, since he manifests his tender care of us in them, and regards us with the eyes and heart of a father. If we were whole strangers, he would abandon us. If his paternal rod is for his children, his rod of iron is for his enemies.